We know that uh, after studying philosophy and uh, quantum physics, uh, uh, you decided to move to agriculture and, uh, and nutrition. So we wanted to know uh, why you decided to, to change and if uh, your previous exp expertise was uh, useful for, uh, for your current activities. Um, I became an ecological activist because of a beautiful movement called CHIPCO where women from my area came out and said, we won't let you cut the trees. And they are our mothers. They give us soil and water and food. And uh, these are not timber mines. Um, so I learned my ecology and biodiversity from women who'd never been to school. But agriculture became my concern in 1984. 1984 was the year when very severe violence erupted in the state of Punjab in India. Punjab means the land of five rivers, richest part of India, most prosperous farmers. And this is where the chemical agriculture was introduced in the name of the Green Revolution in the 60s. In 84, there was war. 30,000 people had been killed. That same year, on 2nd of December, a pesticide plant leaked from a union carbide factory and killed thousands of people. And children are being born today maimed and deformed, and the huge cancer rate in that city. And at the end of that year, we lost our prime minister. She was shot dead because of the violence of Punjab. And at the end of that year, I asked myself, why is agriculture so violent? Why is there violence in Punjab, 30,000 deaths? In Bhopal, 30,000 deaths. And I was working for the United Nations University at that time. And I said, I need to study this. Where are these conflicts coming from? So I did a study on Punjab in the Green Revolution and found out where the chemicals came from, Hitler's Germany, how the Green Revolution was imposed by Rockefeller and the World Bank and the US government. We didn't choose it. Our farmers didn't choose it. And what the harm it had done to the richest land of India. So I decided after the study that I would dedicate my life to a nonviolent form of farming. And that's what I've done since 1984. So uh, you, you said that uh, you, you asked yourself uh, uh, this question, so why agriculture was, uh, was so violent. Yeah. violent. And uh, it's, in fact, you also talk about uh, uh, nutritional altruism. Yes. Uh, so c can you explain uh, what does that mean? Um. If the Green Revolution was about forcing chemicals, saying the soil is dead, inert matter, you need the fertilizers, otherwise you can't grow food. <laughs> Globalization created a food and nutritional totalitarianism. First, by living, allowing the Monsantos of the world to push GMOs and patents on seed. But no local seeds have much more nutritional content. The GMO seeds have much more toxic content. Second, forcing free trade so that the Cargills can dump bad wheat for bad pasta. I see on this trip, there's so many more obese children in Italy, which I didn't see three years ago. And 50% of the young children of this country with the Mediterranean diet are suffering from obesity, which is linked to an industrial diet because you're being forced to an industrial diet. <clears throat> and the final plank of this is the companies that wrote the laws on sanitary and phytosanitary measures are Coca-Cola, Pepsi, Nestle. So you have four companies controlling poison and GMOs. You have four companies controlling trade. You have four companies controlling junk food. And they force countries to give up healthy eating, sustainable agriculture. They force people to eat food that gives them, makes them sick and diseased and obesity, diabetes, cancers are exploding. <clears throat> and worst, it is a thinking that says farmers must be removed from the land. And the new thinking is farming without farmers, fake food from labs. And I hope you as young generation of mind changers will change the mind of people from thinking of food as stuff, food as a commodity, to food as life, and start a huge movement against a buffalo mozzarella that doesn't come from a buffalo but comes from a lab, 
and is made at, at the cellular level. Um, a meat, impossible burger that is made from GMO soya. We don't have to lie about food because how we grow food decides the fate of the earth, the fate of society, and our health. It is too important an issue to be left to a gang of four greedy corporations. My most recent book, From Greed to Care, that's been published in Italy, is about these changes. And I think uh, this also uh, connects very well with uh, ethic. Uh, in fact, I wanted to ask, uh, ask you one more question about uh, the eco-feminist movement because uh, I, I know that you, uh, you're part of it uh, and you say that uh, uh, you believe uh, that, that there should be a new anthropology where uh, uh, there, there should be the possibility of a, of a new cooperation uh, uh, between uh, uh, species uh, and uh, and, um, and mutual love between them. And uh, for this reason, uh, you think uh, that uh, there shouldn't be just uh, a human ethic, but also a, a global ethics. And so uh, how do you think uh, we can uh, reach uh, yeah. global ethic? Well, most societies that have lasted over millennia saw so human beings as one member of a very, very diverse earth family. In India, we even have a word for it called Vasudheva Kutumbkam. Vasudha is the earth, Kutumbkam is a family. And in her family, the trees and the bees and the earthworms and we are relatives. So it is both the ancient way of thinking as part of the earth, and it is the emerging way of realizing, because new science is confirming these thoughts. My, I did my PhD in the foundations of quantum theory, and it totally um, rejects the idea of separation, that things are separate. There's a glass here and this. Everything is interconnected. And that interconnectedness is also between all the species of the world. We, as we sit and talk, you are only 10% of you. You're 90% other beings, viruses, bacteria, your gut microbiome is a hundred trillion microbes, hundred trillion. They are the majority of you. So we are interbeings. And this new interbeing cons consciousness is vital to address three issues that are destroying humanity and the planet. The first is the disease of separation and animosity, both between humans and humans, as well as humans and other species. The second is related to the fact that when you think of yourself as separate, you cut off your ethics and responsibility to care for others. When I care for the soil, I will cultivate biodiversity. If I don't, I will spray glyphosate. Glyphosate is war against biodiversity. It is designed to kill everything living. That's its work. The third, very, very big issue is from this thinking of separation comes inequality. Comes not just our separation from other species, but the idea that some human beings are more privileged to the gifts of the earth than all of us. I believe that we all have a right to the earth's gifts. Her food, her water, her breath, her biodiversity, her healing. One percent cannot own this planet and push millions and millions to poverty and hunger, and the 1% cannot create an ecocide to push 80%, 90%, 100% of the species that support us because they live in the illusion that they run the world, their money runs the world, their machines run the world, their technologies run the world. They don't realize that the world is living systems in interaction. And that's why we must live with love and humility, compassion and courage. And, and the myths of, of the 1% is something any mind changer should be very awake to. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.